So the topic of my talk is uh, running on empty, uh, understanding the impact of the D and uh, health risks for uh, physicians and nurses. Uh, my objectives are today to kind of give you a background of fatigue, not only in healthcare but other um, industries as well. Talk a little bit about ha uh, health and safety, and some of the risks to providers and patients uh, when uh, providers are actually fatigued. And then talk a little bit about some improvement strategies. So, what is fatigue? The fatigue. It's a based on the definition of AHRQ. It's a feeling of tiredness, decreased energy. Uh, the causes are actually lack of sleep or quality of sleep or due to long or increased uh, work hours or the volume of work uh, during those long hours. So how many hours do you sleep a night? How many people sleep five hours or less? Six hours? Seven hours? Eight hours? Okay. Uh, so it looks like the majority actually sleep at like six hours, and you'll see that that's um, pretty uh, But sleep deprivation actually can affect patient care. It impairs our cognitive function, our mood, uh, motivation, our response time, and creativity. When we think about um, how sleep deprivation affects us, it not only affects us as a provider, but it affects all those that we work with. Uh, so if we're sleep deprived, we may have less patience for our residents, interns, our colleagues. Uh, we may be quick to uh, answer a question. It may be not appropriate. Uh, but in general, most healthy adults need about seven and a half to eight and a half hours of sleep per night. Uh, and cognitive performance does decline uh, if you're chronically sleep deprived or acutely sleep deprived. So a little bit of background. Uh, this is a... Uh, unfortunate circumstance that occurred in uh, 2014 in Chicago. Uh, this accident occurred um, on a, a train where the uh, train operator actually fell asleep um, and woke up just before entering uh, this surface area. Uh, so there was a trigger that caused them to wake up um, and they hit like a bumper, but unfortunately the train actually derailed and went up an escalator and injured 33 uh, people. And in the um, investigation, the cause of the accident was due to uh, worker fatigue. And this particular worker actually worked for 12 days in a row. Uh, so there are several um, documented uh, related accidents in aviation, uh, railways, and highways. Uh, some, unfortunately, uh, do result in uh, people actually dying from uh, fatigue-related injuries and accidents. Um, in the end, the uh, message really is that people need to be awake and alert in order to do their best. So in 2016, uh, the National uh, Transportation and Safety uh, Board actually uh, started a promotion about um, uh, reducing fatigue-related accidents. And so this is actually their campaign. And they actually started a campaign about driving, so driving while fatigued. Um, so as I go through these, you can think about your own uh, responses after working a long day. Uh, do you find yourself frequently yawning, nodding off, uh, not remembering how you got to a certain place, or even forgetting that you've actually driven a few miles? Um, we have difficulty maintaining speed or swerving in between lanes. Uh, my car actually has... Um, guidance where it'll keep you in the lane and it'll kind of vibrate the seat if you stray within the lane. Um, and it was a really strange circumstance after going a long ride, it was a 10 hour ride, and I actually could feel myself falling asleep. But when you think about this after working a long day, a long shift, 24 hour shift, um, are you really too tired to drive? And the, what they say is that drowsy driving is impaired driving. So you're three times uh, more likely to die in a car crash if you're fatigued. And in 2014, 5,000 people died in the U.S. due to uh, driving-related accidents that were due to fatigue. So there's certainly uh, work-related uh, causes for uh, performance impairment related to fatigue. Uh, some have to do with your work schedule, whether you work days or nights, the actual hours worked, whether you work an eight-hour shift, a 12-hour shift, 16 hours, or a 24-hour shift. 
um, the type of work that you do, whether it's uh, physically demanding, emotionally demanding, and again, the work environment. Non-work related issues uh, that can contribute to lack of uh, performance are the, not only the quality of sleep, but the quantity of sleep, and whether or not you have uh, sleep disorders. I know we're actually starting to look at our patient population and our goal really is that our ICU patients would sleep a little bit more, but no one actually ever assesses them to see if they actually had a sleep disorder before they even entered the ICU. So knowing this about ourselves, again, really does play a part in how we're going to perform. Uh, some of the factors that contribute to workplace fatigue, lack of organization, the uh, workload that you have, um, the feelings of exhaustion, uh, if you work in a, a what we do, we work in a uh, practice that's 24-7. We work 360 uh, days a year. Um, and it's type, the type of business that we work in really has a lot to do with our feelings of fatigue. Um, and again, when you work in an environment where you're constantly putting out fires, uh, there there's emergencies all the time, like in the ICU, um, it can uh, impact uh, your feeling of fatigue. I'm just going to tell you a little bit of a story about um, this particular woman. Her name is Libby Zion, and she's linked to the 80-hour uh, work week. Uh, she was an 18-year-old woman. Uh, this story was from 1984, actually. She arrived in the emergency room at 11.30 at night. Um, she had a high fever. Um, she had some convulsions, flu-like symptoms with jerking movements. Um, she was had a history of depression, was on medication. Uh, it seemed like they got her uh, temperature under control, but during the night it spiked again and she started to get combative. They put her in restraints. They gave her pain medication. Um, by 7.30 in the morning, uh, she had a cardiac arrest and died. And in the end, the investigation showed that there were two issues that emerged, that the number of hours that the interns and residents worked and the amount of supervision that they had while they were on call. And one of the quotes from the attorneys was that working long hours um, and may have contributed because these uh, residents and interns were actually sleep deprived. And uh, Libby Zion's father, um, his name was Sidney Zion, was very well connected in New York. Uh, he was an attorney, uh, was very heavily involved with uh, the newspaper and publication industry, and he really went on a mission uh, not only just because it was his daughter and he lost his daughter, but to try and find out actually what happened and was there something they could do. So this is actually where the 405 regulations came from. Um, so it's unofficially known as the uh, Libby Zion uh, rules. And within five years, all hospitals in uh, New York had to comply with these rules and regulations, which basically went to the 80-hour week. Their initial concerns were uh, related to costs. The uh, hospitals were going to incur more costs because they would need more staff. Um, they were also concerned about handoffs. You know, if they have uh, the residents and interns were working shorter shifts, if the handoffs were going to occur more frequently and they were going to lose information. Uh, but that truly was not the case. Uh, in the end, this is obviously uh, many years later, they thought initially that it was primarily related to the work hours and that sort of thing, but they also recognized that um, it was likely that she died of serotonin uh, syndrome. Uh, it doesn't only occur uh, with residents. There's unfortunate events that occur uh, due to nursing error as well. Uh, so this story is about a fatal medication error of a nurse um, who actually worked, she was an OB nurse, and uh, she uh, made the mistake of um, providing medication that should have been given epidural. She thought it was IV penicillin and injected it um, IV into the patient and the patient died. Uh, when they looked into the cause of the error, um, again, it was uh, primarily that it was related to the number of hours that she had worked. So she worked two eight-hour shifts in a row. Uh, due to fatigue, she decided that she was going to stay at the hospital and sleep there because her shift started again at 7 a.m. She started her next shift, and at 12 noon on that third shift is when this error occurred. And again, there's a lot of unfortunate circumstances that happen. You know, is it a mistake? Is it a crime? Uh, there was a lot of publicity about this particular case. And again, we see it um, in the nursing literature quite often when a nurse makes, mis when a, nurse makes a mistake. Um, they, you know, will lose their license, um, can't practice anymore, and it can be really devastating, not only professionally, uh, but emotionally as well. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the risks to providers and patients. 
this article was actually just um, published recently, June of 2019. Is your doctor making mistakes because he or she is too tired? And basically this article was a, um, a jump off of another article that said uh, outpatient practices, the survey that was completed said that physicians tend to order less tests as the day goes on. So if you see a physician later in the afternoon, you're not as likely to get the same type of screening that you would if you were seen early. So it's not only that in our uh, business, in the nursing literature and the medical literature that we see how fatigue affects us, it's also in uh, the public domain as well. Um, and dealing with uh, workforce fatigue, more than 20% of all serious incidents have negative outcomes or fatigue related. And I think most of us would say there are days when we go into work, you actually start out your day, you may be tired. And by the end of the day, you may be totally exhausted. So I think this is not uncommon for all of us uh, in the room. But fatigue can affect people in the same way that alcohol does. Uh, which puts, uh, leads to higher risk of medical error, which definitely impacts med uh, patient care. Um, it's stated that uh, two hours less of sleep is actually equivalent to three beers. So if they're saying, you know, we need seven to eight hours sleep and we're only getting five to six, uh, the thought is that we're actually arriving to work in an impaired fashion. Um, this uh, study was actually published in 1997 in Nature, and it looked at um, the mean... Uh, relative, um, let me see, uh, the mean relative performance, the hours of wakefulness, and blood alcohol concentration. As you can see, uh, the more hours uh, that you are awake, uh, the more sleep deprived that you are, and it appears that you're actually right in line with um, uh, serious blood alcohol uh, concentration. The red line actually indicates um, in most states in the U.S. what the um, impaired level is for driving, and that's uh, 0 0.08. So again, uh, there have been several studies that looked at this. Uh, the Joint Commission actually uh, stated in, in 2011 that healthcare worker fatigue is a patient safety issue, and the length of the work schedules were found to have a significant impact on workers' uh, quality and quantity of sleep. So the other uh, important piece is that if we are fatigued after we finish working, we're less likely to take care of ourselves. So we're less likely to exercise after, we're less likely to eat properly. So there are some downstream effects that uh, unfortunately do affect us um, if we are fatigued. And basically they said that fatigued nurses and physicians could potentially harm a patient with a lapse in judgment, or they could harm themselves while driving home after their shift. So it's something I think that we all should uh, think about. Uh, in Pennsylvania, they actually reviewed their uh, patient uh, safety reporting system over 12 years, and they found that there were 1,600 events that were fatigue-related. Uh, certainly not all of them uh, resulted in patient harm, but there were four fatal events. Uh, they occurred on a variety of uh, floors, including medical surgical, general medicine, emergency department, pharmacy, and laboratory. And the most common events were actually medication errors. So uh, this is something, it's not only administration, but it could be uh, the preparation, the dosing, um, and uh, it's something that we certainly, uh, if we looked at our own information within our facility, I'm not sure if we would find the same result. And generally, not everything is reported to the state, uh, so this number actually may be worse than uh, what we see here. Uh, this uh, information is actually from the Australian uh, Medical Association. They did an audit uh, basically looking at um, the number of hours that uh, the staff work, so it was interns, residents, attending physicians, and they found that intensive care and surgical um, colleagues were at the uh, highest risk of fatigue at about 75%. Um, and this particular study was performed in uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and it's basically a, their, the parent study for this was called the Sunset ICU, where they wanted to do a trial of uh, nocturnal intensivists, and this study came out of that. So this was a prospective observational study in a medical ICU, and they had weekly randomized staffing models. Uh, so the standard model was residents um, took care of the patients during the evening, uh, the night shift, and they had access to fellows or um, attending physicians if they needed them by phone. Um, and the intervention group had residents within hospital intensivists. Um, they, they captured their information as far as their sleep, their work pattern, their well-being. Um, they wore um, 
devices uh, similar to uh, what we do to track our steps uh, to capture their sleep. Um, and they also uh, participated in psychomotor uh, vigilance testing. Um, so this is basically the, the demographics, as you can see, uh, not very similar to most people in this room. They sleep uh, about six hours. Um, and this was recorded by um, the faculty and the fellows. So there were 13 fellows that participated in the study and 20 faculty. Um, they also asked them to rate whether or not they were a morning person and night owl or neither. Um, and you can see that there was not any um, significance one way or the other. But I think most of us would say that we know whether or not we're a night person or a day person. I'm not a night person. I worked two nights on night shift, and I was glad that that was all I had to do. Um, but there are other people who love night shift. So I think it just depends on your body. But in general, our bodies actually respond to a day-night um, uh, cycle as far as light um, and darkness. Uh, so this is something uh, that we need to think about. And some of the feelings that they actually reported in the morning from this particular study, the intervention group actually had a better quality of sleep, um, and they had um, uh, feelings that they were not tired. Um, and then as far as the sleepiness scale, uh, the intervention group actually was um, uh, less sleepy, um, and their alertness was higher in the intervention group. So again, having um, an intensiveness on at night with the residents uh, decreases stress, so there were less calls for the residents and fellow or the uh, fellows and attendings, um, and they had more of a normal lifestyle at home. The interesting thing that I found with this um, too was that. Um, on the, on the majority of the time, the number of hours that the fellows and, and attendings are working was about 80 hours a week. Uh, so they still are working just as many hours, but their nights when they go home are less stressful and they're able to sleep a little bit more soundly. Um, in this particular study, they actually looked, um, again, looking at uh, sleep depri deprivation and alcohol, uh, similar to what the article did in Nature, uh, but in this particular study, they looked at um, subjects over a 28-hour period of sleep deprivation and after measured alcohol, um, doses of alcohol up to 0.1 blood alcohol level. And they had 39 subjects in this study, 30 employees from the transport industry and nine from the Australian Army. And what they found was that moderate uh, sleep deprivation produces impairments very similar to alcohol intoxication. The results are very similar to uh, what we saw in the article in 1997 for Nature. So when you think about you know, um, your performance, uh, if you're a resident or intern or a, nice, a nurse who works night shifts, um, how sleep deprivation really impacts your performance, I think it's very similar uh, to these studies. Um, this article was actually published in Radiology, and it looked at the effect of shift um, schedule and the volume. Um, so they looked at almost 3 million examinations in the radiology um, field, and uh, they found that uh, uh, errors occurred uh, in and around 9 hours, but more, hours, more errors occurred in between 10 and 12 hours. Um, so not only was it related to uh, the number of hours that they uh, were awake and working, but they also found that it was related to the volume. So more volume in examinations uh, found more discrepancies, so the range was one to four um, in a uh, 10 to 12 hour shift. And you can imagine that this, um, there's not much in the critical care literature to support the same finding, but you can imagine that if you're, the volume of patients that you're seeing is higher, it does produce a lot more fatigue and as if you're, if you're caring for 20 patients versus 30 patients, it does really affect your um, ability to be attentive um, and fatigue at the end of the day, um, making it challenging to even go to sleep when you go home. Um, so this is sometimes what we feel, um, you know, uh, working a long shift, you know, I don't know if I should sleep or cry uh, because you're so tired. Um, in this particular journal in the uh, uh, BMJ, they actually had an article talking about early warning signs of physician fatigue. And they picked up information that was actually posted on blogs, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. And this was, uh, these were actual quotes from physicians, um, I just selected a few. Um, and these are some of the things that they said, you know, on about my 32-hour shift, I left a message for a colleague, and at the end I said, I love you. Um, he had a good laugh. Um, more than once he said, I'm going to examine your nose, and uh, proceeded to do an ear exam. Um, Did you ever drink tobacco and smoke alcohol? 
Uh, so just the cognitive ability to get your words in, um, in order uh, are signs of fatigue, and I think that happens to uh, certainly a lot of us. Um, you know, these types of things are not necessarily going to injure a patient, uh, but again, it's a sign that uh, we are fatigued sometimes in the workplace. So let's talk a little bit about some improvement strategies. Uh, in uh, Northwestern, in uh, Chicago, uh, nurse leaders there uh, saw the information that, the, um, that was put out uh, from the uh, Joint Commission about uh, sleep deprivation and healthcare worker safety. So they decided that they were going to do something about it. Uh, so they wanted to bring evidence-based uh, practice into their facility related to um, improving strategies to decrease sleep fatigue and improve uh, the well-being of their nurses. So they created an education and awareness campaign. Uh, they supported periodic rest and uninterrupted meal breaks. Uh, there was a survey that was actually done, and it asked uh, 16,000 nurses, how often are you able to actually take your full lunch break? and only 35% of the time were nurses actually taking their full nurse break. They created a policy, um, a sleep policy, and I'll show you that in one second. Um, they also decided that on uh, incident reports, whether it was a patient incident report or an employee incident report, they were going to assess whether fatigue played a part. Um, they designated a quiet room uh, that looks just like this. So they uh, repurposed some furniture that was in a, a warehouse. They put in chairs, recliners, sofas. Uh, you're not allowed to eat in here. Uh, there's no talking. It's called a quiet room. You're allowed to listen to music, but only with um, headphones. Again, it's a place where um, nurses are able to go um, to take a little bit of a break. Um, they also created a transportation kitty, which actually has money in it. So if you feel that you're too fatigued to drive home, uh, you can use those funds for uh, transportation, uh, either by taxi or an, uh, other means as well. Uh, as far as the uh, sleep policy, this is uh, just a small excerpt of it. So you're not allowed to sleep in a sleep-like position in a patient area or a public hospital space, so that's prohibited. However, an employee is authorized, if they're authorized from a person, so basically your charge nurse, um, you may rest or sleep while on break in a designated non-patient uh, care area in a non-public place, which is the quiet room, um, uh, during non-work periods. So during your breaks, during your lunch, uh, so they're actually promoting that uh, nurses take breaks. They have a buddy system where, um, you know, the two nurses, one encourages the other one to make sure they take breaks. Uh, they do a lot of checking on the staff about their well-being. Are they well-rested? Um, and again, this has been going on for uh, several years now at this particular institution. Uh, initially, it didn't work very well, uh, but they implemented some new policies. Um, and I think the staff has really... Um, uh, caught on and, and this quiet room is really working out well. Uh, some of the uh, suggestions from the uh, University of Pennsylvania team said that um, they're actually conducting uh, short surveys of professional fulfillment and well-being while, they're on, while physicians are on service and when they're off service. Uh, one of the suggestions is that you would have a nighttime intensivist, but again, that's not necessarily feasible in all institutions because there's some financial impact there. Uh, using telemedicine uh, for nighttime staffing. Contracting with EICUs is another uh, means to um, allow uh, physicians to not have call during the night. And then there's one interesting uh, project that's actually going on now. It's a study in um, Atlanta, in Emory, where they have temporary uh, relocation of the clinicians to an EICU-based um, time zone that's 12 hours away. So they actually have clinicians that are in an EICU in uh, Australia, which is 12 hours difference from uh, Atlanta. So they're manning it during the day in Australia while they're monitoring the ICU at night in Atlanta. Um, so this is a study, and hopefully we'll see the results um, from this uh, fairly soon. So one important piece of this is to know when you're fatigued. Uh, 
it would actually indicate to us some of the information that's been provided by the AHRQ um, that healthcare workers who are fatigued um, often don't know when they're fatigued. Um, so you may be yawning frequently. Um, sometimes it's your body posture. So they say that the body says what the words don't. Um, so kind of being hunched over, you know, yawning, not necessarily being attentive. Um, there are things that um, happen to us when you are fatigued, and there are messages that our bodies uh, give. And I'm just going to leave you with this. Um, this was a, a statement in uh, JAMA uh, talking about some uh, fatigue, articles and fatigue, and it said, physicians must recognize that it's neither unprofessional nor weak to admit sleepiness or fatigue when on the job and make efforts to mitigate potential consequences to patient care. And again, you just want to reinforce the fact that it's not only patient care, but it's your health as well. So um, after a long shift, you certainly want to, don't want to put yourself at jeopardy um, and driving in an unsafe condition. Thank you so much for your time.